Right, so today we are going to continue working with monads. So we did monads last time, right? And we're going to do one motivation for monads, which is to construct the so-called Kleisley category. So Kleisley is a Swiss mathematician, um, so it's named after him. But, uh, and it's one way to understand where the laws of the monad are coming from. And it's also quite, so it, it's a construction here where you start with an arbitrary monad and you construct a category. But I think you can, so, so on one hand, of course, this is very abstract, right? I mean, you take this abstract thing and you construct this abstract thing. But you can understand it from a very practical point of view, I think. But you're really saying that this construction is making precise this idea that a monad has something to do with effects in the sense that uh, uh, if you have something of type M of A, then it's like having an A with the M effect on top, right? And, and this construction is making this uh, making this precise. So, uh, pardon? When? when? Oh, this is quite early 60s or something like that, I think. Don't, don't quote me on that. But um, Right. So what's the idea? So the idea is, like I said, that we want to have a category where the morphisms are, in some sense, effectful functions. And we're going to use the monad that we've been given to specify what we mean by an effect. So this is, again, something we do in Haskell all the time, right? Where we're saying that, well, if I have a function from A to state of B, then that's like a function from A to B, which also can use the state monad in order to, to have some global state. Or if I have a function from A to maybe B, that's like having a function from A to B, but it can also maybe have the effect of failing and producing nothing rather than producing an A, a B, right? Uh, but the point is that we can do this for an arbitrary category C and for an arbitrary monad. Right? We don't just have to do it for, for the category of sets and, and just for the maybe, etc. cetera. Uh, so, we, uh, right, so we can, we can go and look at what the monad is, and that's probably a good thing to do anyway. So it says that, well, as as soon as you have any category C, uh, and as soon as you have any functor from C to C, so it's mapping the objects to, to objects and functions, uh, morphisms to morphisms in the same category, right? Then you can ask, is this a monad or not? And it's a monad if you have these two natural transformations. You have the return, which says that you can take zero layers of M and turn it into one layer of M. So you go from the identity, so from X to M of X. And you have the join natural transformation, which says if you have two layers of M, so M of M of X, you can join it back down into one layer of M. Right, so in particular, the identity functor is a monad where this is the identity and this is the identity. You're right, yeah. Yes. Uh, but often we're interested in a particular monad, right? One that says that, okay, I can do state, or the one that says I can do, yeah. Uh, so let's see if we can make this precise. So we have a monad M and we want to make a category. So in order to do that, uh, we have to define the object, say what the morphisms are, say what the identity morphism is, what composition is, and then prove some laws here, right? Uh, so the idea is that the objects should really be the same, right? We just have our notion of effectful morphisms now, but that doesn't change what the object is, right? So I'm going to say that the objects here are the objects of C. So I have a monad on C, so I have a category C. But I'm going to have a new notion of morphism. This is going to be one of these effectful morphisms, which means that it should go from X into M of Y, for example, right? So I'm saying that the morphism here from X to Y so X and Y are objects in this category, which are the same things as the objects in the original category. And I'm saying that this is going to be a morphism in C from X to the action of M on Y. That's why I, all of this here is in the context of this C up here, right? Uh -huh. So I'm saying that a basic morphism, should be careful, careful, careful. 
my objects are the same, so uh, amorphism from x to y in, uh, in this Kleisley category is the same as amorphism from x to m of y in C, right? Okay, so then we need to have... Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, right, so, so that's a definition I can make. So this is a collection of morphisms, right? But now I need to show that there is an identity and that there is a composition. And this is not at all obvious anymore, right? Because the identity in C, for example, <laughs> does not work anymore because the identity in C goes from X to X for every X, right? But now here I need a morphism from X to M of X. That should be the type of the identity, right? Because this is morphisms from X to X in the Kleistley category. We can see that if we see what we are asked to do. So here we see that now, okay, so it's called A instead of X. Um, I need a morphism in C from A to the action of the functor to A, right? And, and luckily that was indeed exactly one of the data we have to make up a monad. That was the Hadbur return, which goes from A to M of A for every A, right? The one that takes zero layers and into one layer. So if you think of this in terms of effects, we're saying that the identity morphism for each object is the trivial thing, which doesn't really have any effect, right? We embed pure things into effectful things. So here I can say the return of M it. Okay, and then here for composition, we're given f and g. Okay, and let's maybe write this at the board. So we have letters a, b, c. So I have an f which goes from a to m of b, and I have a g which goes from B to M of C, right? And now all in all, I need to make something which goes from A to M of C, right? You see, it looks like I'm in trouble because these two things don't join up here. I can't just compose in C this morphism and this morphism because they don't have the same thing in the middle. But what can I do? Well, I can start with F to get me to m of b, right? And then I can't use g directly, but I can use the action of m on g. So if I do m of g, that's going to go from m of b to m of m of c, right? Uh, so no, so m is a functor as well, right? Oh. So m has an action on objects, and it has an action on morphisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here I can do M of G. That's going to get me to M of M of C because G itself was from B. Remove the M's here again. G had this type. So if I apply M to it, I get something from M of the domain to M of the codomain, right? Uh, but where I wanted to end up was at M of C. But again, thankfully, I have exactly what we need, which is a way to, to squash two M's down into one M, right? That's the joint. Uh, so that's something that at least has the right type if I do that. So I compose these three things in order to compose. Let's see if we can do that. So I compose in C, and the first thing I said was F. And then I compose in C the f map of m on g and then here now i need to go from m of m of c to m of c which is what the join is doing right. okay so i have something that type checks at least right um, so what's the idea well we have this effectful thing and then 
inside the M, we can run this G, and then we can join the effects together at the end, right? So we're going to get the effects of F, and we're going to get the effects of G, and they're going to be joined together into just one effectful thing in the end. So it's Yeah, so, so join is doing usually the, the thing you expect it to do, right? If you have a maybe or maybe, then you say, okay. Yeah. Okay, but then we still need to prove these laws, and I have a note to self in which order to do them. So I want to start with identity right, and then identity left, and then associativity. Right, because what do we need to prove? So this is saying that if you compose with the identity, so remember the identity here is given by the 10. So now if I stick the return here, I should get just a G out, for example. Right? So if I stick the return for my G, I should just get the F out. That's the two identity laws I have. Uh, and if I don't know what this means, then it's quite helpful that Agda is telling me. So here, for example, Agda is telling me that if I stick a return here in the middle, then I should just get the F out in the end. That looks a little bit hairy, so let's see if we can do it. Uh, well, it's too much to just do this in one go, I think, right? So let's do it with equational reasoning. So show that something is equal to well, f in the end and then I have to open this and okay f is not in scope uh, okay that's not very helpful to normalize it a little bit more. Okay, so that's what I get. And now I can clean this up a little bit. Um, so the first thing was the thing that was completely not normal. Oh, sorry, this is a bit hard to see now. Uh, the first thing I had was just saying it was composition in the classical category of the identity and F. Uh, this thing here is the thing that's fully normalized, but it hasn't folded back things. We defined return to be the transform of the natural transformation, so we can clean this up a little bit. We define this to be return of M. We define this to be join of M. And okay, for the open functor, I think here. Uh, no, okay, it's a bad idea to open functor because it's overloaded. Uh, okay, so we need to somehow go from here to here, right? And what can we possibly do? Well, we had some laws associated with the monad. So let's take a look at these. We had these three laws. And in particular, if we compare what we have down here, uh, here we have a composition of an F map of a return followed by a join. That's exactly what we have here on the left, right? So that, that's where this law is coming from. It's so that we can replace this with identity and then what we end up with is just composition with F and the identity, which should be equal to F, right? So the reason that we have this law here is exactly so that we can prove this. Uh, so let's see if we can do that. So that's the map return join law, right? Uh, so I'm claiming that I can go from here to the same thing where all of this just becomes the identity 
and see. You mean, does this happen all the time, or is it a... Um, I don't think so, so... Yeah, so that that's what, what I hope you'll take away from today, is exactly that it's, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's two, two sides of the coin, right? You could say, okay, it's magical, or you could say it's not magical because it exactly lines up. So that, that's why it was defined the way it was. Yes. But, but I would rather say it's not magical for that reason, right? I mean, it means that it, it, there was some underlying structure to it. Yeah, it came from somewhere. Uh, okay, so let's see if we can fi finish this. So this one is one of the identity laws for categories, right? Uh, identity, is it right? Uh, yes. Okay, and here we have the same, starting the same with a composition with F, and then we have some difference. So let's do a Kong here. Okay, and here we now need that this is equal to the identity, but that was what math return join of M exactly said, right? Okay, so this wasn't too bad. Uh, we, the, the interesting thing happening is exactly this math return join, right? And then there's some scaffolding. There's some fact that we only want to do it for part of it and the fact that we have an identity. But if we now, Try to do the same thing for identity left, where again, we have an F. Then this is looking a bit worse. So what's happening here? Well, this is the one, we named this to a G, maybe that's clearer. Uh, F equals G, sorry. So this is the one where in this composite, we are saying, what if this is the identity, right? So this is the return, and then we have an F map of G here, and then we have a join, right? And we want that that should be the same thing as just doing F here. Uh, sorry, uh, just doing G. Right. Uh, so if this is return, and this is really going to M of A. Uh, so the type of G makes sense here, right? G goes from A to M of C, in this case. Uh, and now it may be not so clear anymore why this should be true, right? because the laws we had for monads, uh, they talked about, uh, I guess it's here. These laws talk about what happens if you do a return immediately before a join, or an F map of a return before a join, or a join before a join, right? But here, the return and the join, they're not right next to each other, right? Uh, so what can we do? Well, we also had the fact that these things are natural, right? So they are natural transformations. So that means that we should be able to, to com uh, commute an F map by a join, for example. So let's see if we can figure this out. So here I'm doing the F map before I do the join, but I could also uh, start by, is this right? Uh, no. Uh, what is, what is uh, right, I can do it for the return. Right here, I'm doing an F map after I do a return, but I could also start by doing G. just a G to M of C, 
and then here I could do a return. Um, yes. Not, not return. I yes. Yeah, so return goes from C to M of C, uh, and if I do an F map of it, I end up here. Uh, do I want the F map? No, I think I want the other one actually. Because then I would have a return before a join, which is the identity. So I can also do a return at M of C, right? Uh, and then I'm hoping that this is the same as just doing the identity on M of C, right? So if this commutes, so meaning that it doesn't matter which way around I go, and then I know that this doesn't matter which way around I go, then overall I know that I just have G followed by the identity, which is the same as G, right? Um, but that's a bit daunting to actually do in Agda, right? So it was kind of okay to draw it, um, but right. Uh, but one difference is here on the board, I didn't care about things like bracketing, and I didn't care too much about composing with the identity, etc. Right. Uh, so let me show you how we can do this in a more clever way. You could do it, but it would be painful because you'd have to do a lot of cons with doing things in the middle of something and then applying associativity. And uh, so instead, uh, right, so it wouldn't, I mean, that's what we did here and it was kind of okay, right? But you had to do explicit cons and you had to do explicit identities. Um, so what Connor and I did a few years ago was we said, that, well, you can actually mechanize a lot of this, right? Because if you want to show that two morphisms are equal, what can you do? Well, you can push all the brackets to the left, for example, and then just compare things when the brackets are fully to the left, because you know that things are associative, so it doesn't, shouldn't matter. Uh, and I, similarly, you can remove all the identities because you know composing with an identity does nothing. Um, and you can distribute the functor reply to a composition. You know that that's the same as the, fun the composition of the functors. You know that functor reply to an identity is an identity. Uh, so we can just mechanize a lot of this. So, so it's like building a normal form for these things. Uh, yes, up to a point, right? So, so for example, let's say that we wanted to show that there's two ways to go from here to here in this diagram, you could either go up the top way, we do first do f of f, uh, where f is a morphism from x to x, then you do g, where g is a morphism from uh, f of x to f of y, and then you do f of k, where k is a morphism from y to z. Or you could go the other way around, you do first do f of the identity, then you do g, and then you do f of this composition. Uh, and so we know that this, it doesn't matter which way you go from here to here, right? Because f of the identity is the identity and composing with the identity does nothing. We know that the two ways to go from here to here are also the same because f preserves compositions. And finally, we can assume, if we assume, uh, one more down, uh, that the two ways to go from here to here are the same then it should be possible to say that the two ways to go from the top to the bottom are the same, right? So let me show you how I would do this. You could do this with a lot of pain manually, uh, but this is how you would do it with this little solver that we have built. Uh, so it's, it's a lot like equation of reasoning. Uh, so we're going to, but now we have to say in which category we are doing this. So I'm going to say C is the category, and then I say backslash models, or as I begin, and then I'm going to have something equal to something QED, but instead of this square bracket, I now have this what we call semantic brackets, because 
we just need to make up some symbol. So similarly here, I'm going to have semantic brackets around this. So these are like this. Uh, so I just put semantics brackets around the QED, and, and instead of angle brackets, I have these here. Uh, uh, all right, yeah, good point. So that's models. The idea being that this is an equation which is true in this category. Right. Um, okay, and what do I do? So before, uh, we could just solve these holes, but this time I'm going to do it by hand because it's not completely obvious how to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this left-hand side of the thing I want to prove, I'm going to put that here, and I'm going to do the same thing with the right-hand side. And now I'm going to turn this, I'm thinking of this as the, the semantic equality, the real equality that I want to hold in C. And I'm going to prove it by proving that the two syntactic versions of it are the same. And the solver is saying that if the syntactic version are the same, then the semantic versions are the same. And I get this tactic version by just replacing comp with comp sin, fmap with fmap sin, id with id sin, and other things with the embedding of a semantic morphism into syntactic one with these um, angle brackets. Just finishing this like this. Uh, right, so it's more about the normal forms that you were talking about before. That, so here now, this is a syntactic thing I can manipulate, and I can map it to a normal form, and then I can prove that if the normal forms are equal, then the, the real interpretations are equal. Right. And that's how the solver works behind the scenes. Right. Right. So I just change all of this. Uh, so the f is the real functor, right? And the syntax is already in the fact that I'm here. I'm saying I have a I have a functor, but I need to know which functor it is when I turn it back again. Right. Uh, okay. And the fact that this Agda is happy at this point means that when turning this back into semantics gives me this left hand side, and turning this back into semantics gives me this right hand side. Right. Okay. So I do that, and then. Uh, what I normally do next is I copy all of this, and now I get rid of all the unnecessary things. So this thing here is still bracketed a certain way by the compositions, etc. Right? Uh, so now I get rid of all the bracketing, which is a bit tricky if you use the prefix form of composition. Uh, so I replace this with an infix form, backslash semicolon. Sin, because it's still syntactic. Uh, and if you do backslash semicolon, then you see that there's a few different versions, and it's the, the one that really looks like a semicolon. So you, you go to the right that many times. OK, so replace comps in with the infix version. Um, let's get to copy this. Uh, with the point on being that I don't need these brackets anymore because something like that. Okay, and here I have an F map of an identity, so I can just replace that with an identity. And here I have an identity composed with something, so I can just remove that. Okay. But now, of course, I need to prove that this really is equal to this, right? Uh, well, uh, that's exactly what the solver can prove, right? So all these boring steps you get for free, that's the point, right? Okay, and then I can do the same thing. Uh, I do the same thing from the bottom up. Uh, 
remove oh, removing all the components and placing them with the infix version. Okay, we need to remove the brackets. And I did something strange here. So. Okay, and this step should also be for free, so if I could only type things. So repl. Okay, and now here in the middle we actually have to do some real work, right? Uh, so why why is this true? Well the uh, right, I could also distribute this actually. Let me do that. So that I also get for free. So this is an F map of a composition, right? That's the same as a composition of an F map. And solve cat refl can prove that for you as well. Uh, so now we see that this last bit looks the same, but this is not quite right, right? But that's exactly the assumption we had here. So I'm going to focus on the first bit, by putting a focus like this. And here I'm going to focus on the same bit. Okay, and when you do a solve cat, that's just going to ignore the focus. But the point now is that I can show that this is equal to this by showing that each component of the composition are equal. So I need to show that this component, which I just put in a focus, which means I'm not looking inside it, is equal to this focus. And then I need to show that this is equal to this, which is trivial, right? So I say this by saying, I want to just look at the reduced problem. And then here, I gave a question mark for each part of the composition. So here I have two parts, so I have two question marks. And one of them is this one. This one is trivial, right? I'm showing that the same thing is equal to the same thing. So we have a pattern for this. RD, I don't remember why we call it RD. Maybe it's by definition, an R for reduced. And then here we have something where something actually happens. So it's RQ for something of real quality. And then here, I really have to show the real semantic equality again, right? Between the semantic interpretation of this thing and the semantic interpretation of this thing. Uh, but that's exactly the assumption I have in this case called P, right? Uh, symbol P, yes. Okay. So you can still take an assumption of, of real things and, and use it here in the middle of your syntactic proof. Right? But the point is that you don't now need to worry about bracketing and things like that, that the solver takes care of that for you. Uh, so here's the basic summary of how to use the solver. Uh, if you have an equation you want to prove, you take the syntactic version of f, the syntactic version of g, then you do some steps in between. And the syntactic version is the one where you replace composition with syntactic composition, identity with syntactic identity, and f map with syntactic, and everything else with the embedded version. Uh, you don't need to worry about reshuffling brackets, identity laws, and functors. Uh, but for the interesting equations, you need this pattern of reduced and then RQ of interesting thing here. Right? Uh, uh, you do need it, right? Because uh, no, because I want, I need, I need that if I interpret this, it needs to be exactly this, right? But if I interpret this, the bracketing is going to be different. Uh, so solvecat raffle is saying, okay, they are the same up to reshuffling things, right? Uh, no, so it's not just raffle, right? It's actually solver yeah. says, uh, raffle is the, so solvecat says, okay, this is equal to this up to this proof. Uh, but in practice, we're always going to say raffle here, right? So there's nothing left to prove after you normalized, right? Uh, 
uh, so that's the idea and it's quite useful uh, so now let's see if we can actually use that here uh, so here we have something similar right uh, so i'm going to say in c because we talking about things in C. Uh, models begin. I'm going to copy all of this. And that's going to be my left hand side. And my right hand side is just a G add it immediately okay and then I need to turn this into the syntactic versions so is comp sin uh, no so there's no space here in between yeah uh, okay this is a return of M But the solver doesn't know about monads, right? So I still have to embed this return. There's no return sin or anything like this. You could extend it to know about monads if you wanted. But comp sin, fmap sin, g, join uh, something. Ah, that's the wrong way, yeah. Okay. Uh, something is wrong. I probably had not closed enough brackets. Ah, and this. So I keep writing underscores here because here I should really give the object its, its return of A to M of A, etc. But I haven't introduced that. So Agda can figure it out if I write an underscore. Okay, so now step one was to turn it into this non-bracketed version, right? So I removed that. Uh, right, so if this, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. This is just defined to be this, but in fix, right? Uh, so, so Agda doesn't really have any, yeah, right, I could have said that immediately here, yes, but. Uh, well, maybe, because I'm also deleting all the brackets going from here to here, right? Um, so, what am I saying? I think that's it. Okay. Right, and then we said before, here underneath, that we wanted to change this first bit first, right? I'm going to put the focus on the first bit. And then I'm going to copy it and change what's inside. So we said that this should be the same thing as G Followed by something, is that right? No, I think we said this was a return. Uh, right, that I need to embed. Okay, and I prove something reduced. There's two things. That's the easy bit, that's true by definition. And that's the bit where we were hoping that we had a monad law to do this for us, right? which was return. No, it's a natural transformation. It's the fact that return nt of m is natural. And the objects are something, the function is g. And it looks like we should sim that. Uh, 
Yeah, so that fits. Um, okay. Um, now we can move the focus. So instead of focusing here in the beginning, we can focus here. Okay, and moving the focus is also free, right? Maybe that was a good salt cut raffle. Because what is that going to do? It's going to compare this and this after normalizing. And the first step of normalizing is to remove the focus anyway. So, uh, okay. Uh, so now I'm hoping that this should be the same thing as just the identity here, right? And if it is, then again, this last step should be for free because it's just composing with identity, which is all we know about. Yeah, so, so the, you see that this is how it normally works. So you, you start with a salt cut step, then you do an interesting step, then you have a salt cut step, then you have an interesting step, then you have a salt cut step. Because each salt cut step, you move the focus to somewhere else where you're working. All right. Yeah. Um, okay, so now here, we can do an interesting step, we said. Um, again, let's see if we have to get two equalities because we have one composition. So we want this to be equal to this, and this to be equal to this. Yes. Uh, so I guess it would work. Okay, that's the interesting one. This is the simple one. Okay, and here now we said something qualitative. Um, we need that a return of before a join should be the identity. So that is the return join law. Right. Okay. But the point being that we didn't have to worry about all the reshuffling of the brackets, right? Yeah. So, you this Uh, right, so you, yeah, you could also do uh, it here. Yeah, so you, you, you would get this for free. You wouldn't have to remember if it was identity right or identity left. Yeah. Right. That would basically be the only difference here. Yeah. But hopefully you'll see that, okay, it's starting to be useful when you have bigger things. Right. And Similarly, let's see if we can do associativity, which looks a bit daunting. Could you, so if you're not in the second to last step, uh, everything before the second to last, after the second to last solve cat raffle, could you have just used left associativity then, or right associativity, whichever one you want to use there, to avoid two steps? With, uh... That's with left associativity. From here to yeah. here? Uh, well, you are really doing using the monad law. In yeah, order so you're, you're just skipping the monad law. Uh, right, so, but you can't skip that, right? Because when you apply the monad law, you really do get an identity here. Yeah, but when you apply it to your hierarchy, when you could use that word for the monad law, it's previous. You're saying, right, so instead of solve cut here, I could, of course, do a... Oh, yeah, 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 I think it's Yeah, no, right, you, yeah, you, you really basically have to do a solve cut here because the reduced one compares uh, each part of a composition. And here there, there aren't, there are, I mean, there's two things composed here, but only one thing is composed here, right? So, of course, what SaltCat is doing behind the scenes is applying exactly this identity rule for this case, right? Uh, not really, because here I'm really talking about equality of syntactic things, right? Uh, 
Yes, I can, but only really in this using the reduce combinator. Right, so the problem is that if I try to do reduced here. I'll take everything. Ah, okay. okay let me... Sorry, you can stop me if it's changing. Right, maybe we should. Right, so we don't have that much time. Um, we can look at this. I'm, I'm not convinced. I mean, you might be right, but I'm not entirely convinced. Um, Okay, so let's see if we can finish this one. Um, actually, right, so if we do this, then it's going to be more of the same, right? So I'm, I'm actually going to cheat. Let me just copy it from here. because the steps are going to be exactly the same, except that we have to think a little bit more what we can do at each stage. But I think the important thing is that, so it's the same thing, right? Salt cut, interesting, salt cut, interesting, salt cut. Uh, and what are the interesting steps? Well, we're using naturality of the join, and we're using this last join-join law, right? This is uh, yeah, so so of course the way I wrote this down when I didn't copy it from another file was that I draw the diagram on my piece of paper and then I, I transform that into these things. But the point being that when I draw it on my piece of paper here, I didn't put the different brackets in. Right? And the solver allows me to also not put the different brackets in. Uh, but the thing I finally want to point out is that what have we used in order to make this category, well, we have used each one of the laws, right? This one for associativity, the other ones for the two identities. We have used that join is natural, and we have used that return is natural here. So we have used exactly all of the additional things we put into the definition of a monad, right? We had the operations which we needed in order to define these operations. And we had naturality and the free axioms, which are exactly what you need in order to get the free axioms for a category. So th this is why there, there's no accident that the monad is defined the way it is. It's so that you really get a well-behaved category of effectful functions. So that's where it's coming from. And that's maybe one way to motivate it. Um, OK, um, so on first day, we'll also see another way to see where the monads are coming from. So we can actually understand monads from more simple building blocks. But this is one way to, to see why they are useful, right? Because they give us a notion of what it means to be an effectful program. But let's stop at this point.